Good morning and welcome to worship on this fourth Sunday of Lent, the 27th of March, 2022. We're glad to have you continuing to worship with us during our Lenten series on the hands of those involved in the last few days of our Master's life here on this earth. I invite you to turn your hearts to worship with us this day as I share this greeting. So they took Jesus and he went out carrying his own cross to the place of a skull in Hebrew called Golgotha. There they crucified him. This is not a day for mourning but for awe, wonder, love, and gratitude. All you who bow in reverence, praise him. All you daughters of faith, glorify him. All you sons of faith, stand in awe before him. We stand humbly before our Savior. Remind you that although we believe and trust in God, we have forgotten the covenant that God made with our ancestors and we have sinned. However, God shows us mercy and remembers that holy covenant, giving us peace. He calls us to remember this peace and to pass it along to others. I invite you this day and in the days of the week that stretch before you to show God's peace to your neighbor. as we come to our time of sharing together in prayer this day. Each one of us continues to have our own burdens in our hearts and on our spirits. Burdens for loved ones and friends that are dealing with serious medical issues. Burdens of fear for those that are facing unknown diagnoses, waiting for test results, struggling to find the answers. Our hearts are touched by those who are enduring the grief of loss, loss of family members, loss of a job or the security of a home, loss of peace within their own spirits. And we continue to struggle with the loss of peace in our world. As for some reason, Mankind continues to hate, to distrust, to try and, and cheat and injure and maim and even kill their brothers and sisters of the human race. I invite you this day to join me in prayer for our world, for our communities, for our neighborhood, for our families and for ourselves. Let us pray. Divine Prince of Peace, you came into our world to bring us that peace that passes understanding, an elusive thing that we have not yet been able to experience. There are days when we struggle mightily to find that peace that you have promised us because the world around us seems to be constantly erupting in anger and fear and hatred. We struggle in the midst of the ongoing crises in our world to find a sense of calm and tranquility. We struggle to find your peace. As we gather in your presence this day, O oh Lord, we do pray for peace. We pray for understanding. We pray for hope. Hope for our world. Hope for ourselves. Hope for all. Guide us this day in the prayers that we pray 
in the words that we offer to one another, in the hopes that we harbor down deep in our own hearts. We pray for those among us, O oh Lord, that are struggling with difficult medical diagnoses, struggling with healing from surgery and dealing with ongoing health problems. We pray for your healing touch, for your healing strength to be with each one that is facing those difficult choices this day. For those recovering from surgery, O oh Lord, we pray for daily strength to increase. For those that are having to learn to live with new restrictions, we pray for comfort, for grace, and for guidance. For those that have received diagnoses that reminds them of their own mortality, O oh Lord, we pray for peace. Be with those that are mourning the loss of loved ones and friends who are struggling to make sense in a, a world that many times just doesn't make sense. We pray for our communities, for the upheaval that seems to be a constant nowadays, for the lack of of peace that surrounds us and causes us great anxiety. We pray for our world, O oh Lord, where people still seem to be bent on proving that they're bigger and better and stronger than everyone else. We pray for those nations that are, are set upon by stronger nations. We pray for the people that are enslaved there. We pray that they might find your wisdom and guidance into a new tomorrow. We pray even, O oh Lord, for the aggressors, that they might suddenly realize that we are all in this world together. And we cannot survive without one another. Open our eyes, O oh Lord, all of our eyes, to the reality that this world is currently our home and we need to live at peace with one another so that we can help one another make it through to your eternal home. We pray for those that are caught in harm's way, O oh Lord, that you would surround them with your holy angels, that you would protect them and bring them safely home to their loved ones and their families. Most of all, oh Lord, we pray that we might become the people you created us to be. People living in harmony with one another, people able to show love and compassion and respect to one another. Remind us anew of of your son's example, even the example that he gave to us on the cross as he prayed, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Speak to us this day of peace, of hope, of understanding and of love. For we ask it in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ, who has taught us to pray together saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The scripture this morning as we continue in our series about the hands of those involved in the final 48 hours or so of Jesus' life here on earth. The scripture comes from the 19th chapter of John 
And I'm using it just to kind of set the stage, if you will. Because the individual we're going to talk about today has no name. Reading from John chapter 19, beginning with the 16th verse through verse 25. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It said, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Hebrew. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. This is the word of God for God's people. Thanks be to God. Since Pilate took office, the place called Golgotha had been busy. At least a hundred crucifixions a month, sometimes more, took place on that mound overlooking Jerusalem's garbage dump. The Roman soldiers assigned to the capital city are kept busy just keeping track of the action going on out there at the hill. The crosses, they're used over and over and over again. Wood is scarce in this part of Israel. The cross on which they nailed Jesus was not a new one. It was not freshly hewn and plain smooth. The man who chopped out its rough outline some long ago day, the man whose axe and chisel gave it form and shape, knew what he was doing. The cross was strong. Fashioned of the most durable wood, it was made to last. For scores of executions, the cross had been pulled from its place in the Roman guard working yard and tossed on the backs of those whose crimes against the state deserved nothing less than the cruelest of death. The wood on, of the cross had lost its long ago fresh cut scent as it bumped through the narrow streets of the holy city borne on the back of the stumbling, sobbing wretch whipped out to the hill of death. The cross had become splintered and battered, but still serviceable for its purpose, for death. From execution to execution, it travels up from the prison courtyard out into the streets of the city, through the shop line streets, through the gates, and up the winding path to Golgotha, the place of the skull. 
once there, each time it raises, raises a screaming, broken man above the city. For a day or two, sometimes three, even perhaps four, the cross stands rooted on the hill as poison slowly accumulating in the veins sends searing cramps to the body of the man stretched out tight against the wood. The blood of murderers, traitors, rebels, rapists, thieves, deserters and fools mingle to stain the wood of the cross. And each time the spike has to be forced a little bit deeper to hold fast. Oh yes, the cross is not a new one. It was built long ago to endure, and endure it has. Long enough for our Lord, yours and mine, to be nailed to it, to die on it for us so that we might be forgiven. In all the crucifixion stories in the Gospels, there's one man whose story is never told. We're disgusted by the disciples and their desertion and denial. We condemn Pilate. We commend Simon of Cyrene. We are even moved by the centurion who, looking on, declares truly this man was the Son of God. And yet I have to wonder, what about the common soldiers? The ones elected or ordered to the guard detail on Golgotha that day. There was a captain of the guard, I'm sure a no-nonsense by the book kind of soldier. There were the rookies, the tough old sergeant who gambled for the clothes of the dying men. And then, then there was the executioner, the man whose sole task was that of nailing the condemned men to their crosses. The man who swung the hammer has a story to tell, too. Listen to the tale of the man who has the hands of execution. It was a crucifixion like any other crucifixion, I suppose. Although the festivities and commotion in the city did make the event draw a little more attention than usual. But my part of it was pretty routine. A couple of men stretch him out, and I just hammer him down. Two nails in the cross piece, one in the upright. It's not a pretty sight. A guard with a whip usually takes his toll and down in the courtyard and climbing up Skull Hill with a cross on your back, well, that takes almost everything you've got left in you. Still, even when they're stretching the condemned men out on that cross, you can see that last hope burning in their eyes. Something, they hope. Something, maybe something will change. When they feel my first spike, they know. It's better to watch where you're hammering than to look into the eyes of those men you crucify. After a while, you get hardened to it, I suppose. We usually toss down some wine before we have to do it, and then we get as drunk as we can afterwards. In fact, I was sharing a bowl of wine with some of the guards when they came and told me to get my hammer. Just my luck to get stuck with this job during the Passover. Eli, my dad, keeps babbling that the least I could do is quit shaming my people during this special time. But the Romans wanted me around just in case Pilate can't settle things down. Father and my people may not love me for what I do, but hey, the Gentiles don't leave me penniless. I'm no fool. 
This particular job did seem a little strange, though. I must admit, I felt a little uneasy nailing through that hand. The kind of hand that had calluses and the hard kind of muscle shaped to swing a hammer. His hand shook when I did it. But he didn't scream. And his eyes didn't hate. That's the first one, the only one, whose eyes didn't hate. As I think back on it now, all the others did. This is what Jesus suffered for you and me, my friends. Crucifixion was an old method of execution used by the Romans as one of the cruelest forms of exacting death. The sons of Israel did not use it. When a Jew was condemned to death for sins against God or his people, all of his fellow men participated in his death by stoning. And yet God had prophesied that the Savior of the world would die on the wood of a tree. And so it's not by accident that the Romans, with their own instrument of death, were now governing the Jews. When Jesus of Nazareth was born, the stage was already set for his death. We must never forget that Jesus was God in the flesh. Yet Jesus, the Son of God, could not make the agony of Jesus, the Son of Man, any easier or any more bearable. His divinity gave him power over death, but he could not offer us the opportunity to be spared the consequences of our sins until his humanity accepted the sheer agony of a brutal death. We may never be able to fully understand the deity of Jesus, but his humanity was no different than ours. Who among us would willingly give themselves to have three nails hammered into their extremities and be stretched up into the sun to die? What man would accept this kind of death if he didn't have to? Surely not the average man. Jesus of Nazareth knew exactly what his decision meant. And as a man, he was terrified by what he had to do. Just before he surrendered to Judas in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed. Separated from the others, he experienced a cold anguish that comes over a man who knows that his moment to accept or reject a horrible death has come. Later on, Mark wrote in his Gospel, he took with him Peter, James, and John and began to become horror-stricken and desperately depressed. My heart is nearly breaking, he told them. Stay here. Keep watch for me. And then he walked forward a little way and flung himself on the ground, praying that if it were possible, he might not have to face this ordeal. Dear Father, he said, all things are possible to you. Please let me not have to drink this cup. And yet it's not what I want, but thy will be done. Listen, uh, the executioner is answering questions from the governor's liaison. No, sir, he didn't scream. He didn't scream at all, although that big carpenter's arm of his strained with every blow of my hammer. He didn't cry out, but you could tell every fiber in his body wanted to. I've seen that kind of pain before. The condemned Gentile, he only knows the torture that the cross was designed to inflict. 
But the Jew, the Jew, he knows that when his people call death down on him, even God himself turns his back. So I nailed that big carpenter's hand to the crossbar and I wished I was drunker. I didn't want to do it, but I have to obey orders. It made me sick. If it wasn't for a couple of old men in the Sanhedrin and a chicken Roman governor, I might have been wrestling that strong arm across the table I built in my father's house instead of hammering it to that spar on Skull Hill. You get used to it, though. And by the second cross, the nails pounded in easier as I got my hammer in rhythm. I was busy and didn't look up for a few minutes, and, and when I finally looked back up at the cross, the man called Jesus was praying. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. I've done this a lot of times before, so I'm pretty good at it. But the look in his eyes was different. It, they seemed to say to me more than what his lips were saying. He seemed to be saying, please find out what I really mean. I cannot hate you. It was almost as if his body wanted to fight loose from the cross, but his heart was so busy, so deeply pitying me, and almost, almost, oh, I don't know. I'll never forget this one. That look still haunts me. Some, some men, you nail them down, and they spit in your face and curse you and Caesar and God. Those men don't haunt you. Battering them down to that cross is easy. But I'm haunted by the face of that man called Jesus that I crucified. He didn't have to die. And he had more of a reason to hate me my people, the men I work for, why couldn't he have just looked at me with pure hatred in his eyes and made it easy? There must be some reason. If I could find one of his men, perhaps I can find out. If I can't, now just go away. I've answered enough questions. I don't want to think anymore. I don't want to remember. Tomorrow's the Sabbath, and he said something about rising again in three days. I wonder. Once he was nailed to the cross and raised up above Golgotha, Jesus faced the most terrifying torture of all. He was being punished for all the immeasurable evil that every other human being had ever committed or would commit. It may not have made his physical pain any greater, because it's difficult to imagine a greater pain than the cross gave. But when Jesus accepted the evil and the sin of all men, God, his Father, turned his back on him. The sheer isolation of Jesus hanging on the cross without help, without God, must have been infinitely more terrible than any of us could ever understand. How could he take the punishment for every human being that's ever lived or ever will live? No one will ever really know. But he did. He didn't want to, we know that. He had already asked his father if he had to drink this cup. In the Garden of Gethsemane he prayed, Father, please, 
Let this cup pass from me. Take it away. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. It was written that the Son of Man, the Son of God, had to die for all mankind. The prophets foretold it. Who was he to go against his Father's will? He knew he couldn't. How great was his faith? How much greater than ours? We have trouble obeying our earthly fathers when they ask us to clean out the garage, do the dishes, take out the trash. And yet Jesus allowed himself to be hung on a cross. To go through the physical torture that I've described because his father willed it. Because his father said, you must die for all mankind. Because only through you can they ever know me. That was reason enough for Jesus. Now, I have not painted this picture this morning to be brutal, but to help all of us realize the pain and torment that Jesus must have gone through for us, for all mankind. We know that on the cross, he must have faced his greatest temptation, the temptation to hate. As a man, he had more human reason for hating than any man has ever had. He was dying the most brutal death ever devised by mankind for sins he never personally committed. He had not done any of those things that were common to men of that day, or any day since, those crimes against God or humanity. And yet he was cut off from God the Father. The men whose petty vanity had nailed him to the cross that day stood at the foot of the cross and dared him, dared him, come down from the cross, miracle man, if you're the Son of God, show us your power. You say you can command 12 legions of angels. Call on them now. If you're the Son of God, come down from the cross. Prove it. No temptation could have been greater than to step down from the cross and cram their guilt down their throats. He might even have been able to rationalize it by saying he came down from the cross to prove that he was who he said he was, that he was the Son of God. But Jesus stayed on the cross. He accepted the cross to die even for their sins. To give in to them would mean that they the Pharisees, the rabbis, the scribes would have to die condemned. Jesus of Nazareth would not give in to the chance to hate. He had to go all the way to death. We sit in our pews during Lent on other days for worship and we think of the words of ritual and pageantry. We think of the words of the scriptures. We remember the lovely pastel pictures from our Sunday school papers. And we think of Golgotha as a hill of saddened serenity instead of as a crag of violence. We find it hard to believe that we too would have joined the crowd in screaming, crucify crucify him. Jesus of Nazareth 
died in terrible pain. He died having finished what he was born to do. He died for those who screamed for his crucifixion. He died for us. He died to give hope to the man whose muscles swung the hammer that nailed him to the cross. That's why he placed his hand under the man's hammer in the first place. Let us pray. We were all there that day on Calvary, O oh Lord. One way or another. Like Judas, we were there as a betrayer. Like Peter, we have denied him. Like Pilate, we have stood in judgment of both you and others. And we've been just as guilty as the man who swung the hammer. Forgive us. Forgive us for our role in the execution of your son. And yet thank you too. Thank you for our role on that day because had it not happened, we would not be able to stand in your presence. We would not be able to call you Father. So Father, we pray as your son prayed, Father, forgive us. We know not what we do. Grant this prayer for us this day, O Lord. In the name of our crucified Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. May the words of forgiveness that Jesus prayed on the cross fall anew on your ears. And may the love and forgiveness that he bought that day on Calvary touch your life and lead you forward into this day and this week. Go now in his grace and love and forgiveness. Amen. Oh,